So the next three or four hours, we're just going to sit back, relax. We'll pop the door. 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 We'll pop
Yeah, the second sign possibly could get into the pollen of the flowers. We're going to have a lot of pollinators out there because they love oxygen. So you don't want to do that just before they flower. So you'd actually shear that off, feed them a little bit. I love using polytum from the best of the fertilizers out there, all natural. Even if it wasn't all natural, I still recommend it. But it does a nice job for most of those evergreens. But you shear that off, give a nice feeding, push out that new growth. And then after they're done flowering, then apply your systemic so kind of keep that in mind. We're going to talk more about power rates here a little bit if you don't mind. But anyway, that's what's going on right now. A lot of things start to bloom right now. I think what's going to happen, a lot of stuff is going to pop. Don't blink. Put on your seat belts because it's going to happen all one time. Anybody know what that is? I burn them. Our lease side, old. Oh, been around for a long, long time. I remember way back when I was just a kid starting this business. Uh, Carly side away, everybody wanted that. Then Jedi came along, which was a little more compact, and everybody wanted Jedi. Today, we don't sell very many of these. I don't know why, I'm still a great plant, great plant here. The fragrance is unbelievable. And by birds, of course, the word of course, the plant, you can find it by bird and put it out anywhere in the landscape. But great plant out there started to show some good color as well. Now, I mentioned earlier about some weeds that were growing out there right now. Anybody have any weeds that are growing out there? Weeds that are growing out there? Weeds that are Anybody have this grass growing? Can you tell me what that is? Grass, exactly right. And it started, but what's interesting is this one started growing back in the late summer and fall, stayed green all winter, now it's really starting to come along. And look, it's already starting to set seed. This is annual bluegrass. And annual bluegrass, like you can see right here, if we don't get on it early, that's what it does. Sets seed, and now you're dealing with it for years but down the road. So this is one of those winter annuals, actually it's an annual bluegrass, that starts to come up in the fall, over winter, it's gonna just hang in there, and as soon as you get a few more days, this stuff pops up everywhere. The best way to get rid of this is either a total vegetation or do what I did right here is take it out. You can also use pre-merged herbicides in the fall. You might use pre-merged herbicides? Really help you out as far as keeping the weeds down, stop those weed seeds from uh, germinating and growing. But what's interesting about pre emergent herbicides for these weeds that are in this box right here is that you actually have to put them down in the fall. We don't think about putting down pre emergent herbicides in the fall, it's always in the springtime. So, what else is coming up right now that does the same thing? Anybody have this little winer growing everywhere in the garden, garden in containers and everywhere else? Nice select type leaf. Sometimes they get bigger than that because there's two different types. It's chickweed. Good old chickweed. It's another winter annual. Comes up in the fall, just sits there, stays nice and tight. And when soon as we get some degree temperatures of 40, 50 degrees, it starts to grow like a weed. And it's go look at it. It's already flowering, starting to set seed. So the best way to get rid of this, being it's an annual, is just take your rake and rake it out. Not much of a root system. I always make everything dirty where I show up. Um, not much of a root system, so you can actually rake it out. Once you do, it's an annual, it's done. But if it goes to seed, now you're dealing with those seeds in the fall and again in the, uh, in the springtime. Uh, you know, the good thing about chickweed is that it's very edible. Could you wait for the microphone, please? If you're going to put grass seed down in the fall and you want to do the pre-emergent, will it, you, is there a pre-emergent you can use that will keep away that Great question. Grass? Is there a pre-emergent that you can use because I want to put down grass seed? There is. Scott's first step for newly seeded, sodded lawns is the only one I think that's available out there. Green, Greenview used to have one, and I don't think they do it anymore that's available for you to use as a pre-emergent. It lasts for about 45 days, and it gives the grass seed just enough time to get up and start growing, and then you can reapply after that. But it works as the pre-emergent, but doesn't stop grass seed from coming up. So you can actually do that in the springtime as well. You know, fall is the best time for sowing grass seed, September. And we say fall, but we're really looking at September, late August, September, and into early October. And the longer you wait, the more the window closes. So we're really still in the summertime sowing grass seed, but we say fall. But that's actually the best time, but we sell more grass seed, and there's more grass seed being sown in the springtime than any other time the rest of the year. 
but you're a good question because you have to be careful when you put the pre-emergent down if you're going to do some seeding. A lot of times in the fall, um, we won't put down a pre-emergent. We'll just kind of deal with it. We'll get the grass up and growing because this stuff, the thing that's interesting about all these weeds and the weeds that are in your yard is that once the lawn thickens up, those weeds can't compete with the grass. So see weeds, you know, grass thins out and weeds move in. Weeds don't move in and make the grass thin out. It's the grass thins out and they have the opportunity to grow. If you look where there's a nice thick lawn, you won't find any of these weeds growing there unless it's thinning out. Anybody have dandelions growing in your yard? If you look at your yard and you look at where dandelions are growing, all right, and sometimes it would be the whole yard, but if you look at where they're growing, where do you typically see them sh shooting up? Exactly, along the sidewalk. That hell strip out by the street, you know, they call it the hell strip between a sidewalk and a street. Boy, those things are always loaded with it. Hillsides, you know, those are the areas where the lawn's thinned, and that's where dandelions move in. And it's the same with all these weeds as well. So your goal over time is to get your lawn so thick that you don't need a pre-emergent herbicide. So somewhere down the road, we won't have to use those. But great question, because those are, those are available for you, and I think Scott's is the only one that has it. The thing about chickweed is that it is very edible, and it's probably one of the most nutritious green you can eat, even more nutritious than kale. Anybody had a chickweed smoothie lately? No? Why not? Anybody tried it? Try it. You know the old theory, if you can't beat it, eat it. Why do they call it chickweed? Chickens love it. They absolutely love chickweed, and that's why it's called chickweed. But the pioneers way back when couldn't wait for this to grow, the green up in the springtime because it was their first source of early greens and, again, very nutritious, yeah, eaten fresh or cooked either way. The other thing about chickweed, it's an appetite suppressant. And as you can see, I don't eat chickweed. But it does work that way. So we've got the annual blue. We've got the chickweed coming up. How about this one with the purple flower? Not, not violets. Take a look at it. As a matter of fact, in about, well, right now, if you drive along 71 and look at some of the un, unplowed uh, fields out there that the farmers haven't gotten into yet because it's too wet, you'll see they're starting to get a nice purple cast to them. Um, this, is, this and its cousin um, are really give a nice show. This, is, this happens to be henbit. The other one that you see in the fields is purple dead nettle. And purple dead, they're both, again, annuals. Winter annuals, they come up from seed. Um, again, look at the root system, not much at all. And they only grow where it's wide open that they can grow. So farmers don't worry about it because it looks nice in the springtime. They go in and plow, turn it under, it's all dead, done deal, and it's no big deal. But that is, uh, this one is called henbit. The other one's called chickweed. Hen, or, uh, hen, henbit and uh, dead nettle. This one has a scalloped round leaf, whereas the purple dead nettle has a pointed leaf and kind of stacked on top of each other. But again, it's an annual, just pull it out of the ground and it's a done deal. How about this one? You really start to see this show up in fields, just now starting to show great yellow color, crest leaf ground cell. Again, it's an annual. Farmers get it in all the fields. You'll get it in your gardens as well. Again, it's a pretty, a, a much better rooted plant than the other ones, but a great uh, yellow flower, but it also is an annual. So again, usually not much of an issue except for in open areas. And how about this one that we talked about a little bit earlier? Dandelions. You know what's interesting about dandelions? At one time here in the United States of America, we had no dandelions. Matter of fact, we didn't have crabgrass. Matter of fact, we didn't have creeping Charlie. As a matter of fact, we may not have had henbit or purple dead nettle. These were all brought here from Europe for a reason, especially this one. Why was this brought here from Europe? I knew this group would say it first. Dandelion wine. But it was much more than that. It's a real workhorse of a plant if you think about this. The roots are boiled for teas and medicinal purposes. The greens are eaten fresh and cooked. The flowers can be battered and deep fried and they taste like deep fried mushrooms. It's absolutely outstanding if you've never tried it before. Or eaten fresh. And of course, then you can make your dandelion wine. So that's why it was brought here for a reason. But of course, as time went along, 
and golf courses became popular with no weeds in the fairways and on the greens. We wanted our lawns to be the same way. And so this started to creep out into the lawns instead of being in the cultivated gardens. And that's why it's become, next to the crabgrass, probably one of the most hated weeds that's out there. All right? Everybody's always trying to get rid of dandelions. But besides the benefits that I just brought up, which most of you will not take advantage of, and if you don't try those fresh flowers battered and deep fried, you're missing out. I'm not kidding you. You got to do it. Uh, now, if you have a dog that wets on at least, you know, make sure you rinse them off really well. But you know what's really beneficial about this dandelion and why I asked if folks leave them alone until they're finished flowering before you do anything about it? Because of the pollinators. Again, this is one of the first early good sources of food for all those pollinators out there. So leave them alone. As a matter of fact, your best time to go after dandelions, if you need to go through and spot treat dandelions, is after they're finished flowering. That's when they become more susceptible. And the best time is in October, and that's the best time to treat for most all weeds that are out there in your yard is in October rather than any other time the rest of the year. So, you know, if your neighbors get upset because you've got dandelions growing in your yard, just tell them Ron Wilson said, like that's going to count. But it really does work, and it's very, very important. And, again, it's going to all come back around. We'll talk about pollinators as we go along. But that's what's so beneficial about those, uh, those dandelions out there. I also brought this along because I, I try to bring this everywhere I can until they finally die back because I want to make sure everybody knows what this is. Now, this has just started to grow. It looks like a big fern at this stage. It's a biennial, so they'll put these fronds up like this, get about two feet tall die back at, uh, sometime during the summer, and then the following year, they'll put out some, a little bit of this, but then they shoot up four, six, eight feet tall with this foliage with white flowers on the top that looks like Queen Anne's laced on steroids. Anybody know what this is? And you see it everywhere. And a lot of folks that don't recognize, haven't recognized it, didn't know what it was, now that you know what this is, it's poison hemlock. Notice the napkin around the bottom you have to adjust it to become, for it to be toxic, you can touch it, but I, I'm gonna handle some of these herbs and feed you later, so I figured you would respect me better if I actually use a napkin here. But this is poison hemlock, and it's becoming more and more of a nuisance and an invasive plant all through the state of Ohio and other states as well. In about another three or four or five weeks as we warm up, watch along the expressways, along fence rows, non-maintained areas, and all of a sudden, you'll start to see these huge patches of this tall, stalky plant with this white flowers on the top that looks like Queen Anne's lace. That's poison hemlock. And you'll start to realize how much we have of this all around the state. And I bring it up because it has become invasive, and it also is extremely toxic. Every part about it is toxic. Just in case it pops up in your yard and garden, and they do, and there have been a lot of folks that will send me an email saying, what is this beautiful flower that I've inherited in my garden? Because it's absolutely gorgeous and it's great foliage. But if the grandkids or the kids or somebody would pick the flower for you and bring it inside, happen to chew on it, do whatever, it is poison hemlock. And that's why we like to bring it to your attention. One real standout when you take a look at this, if you're not sure what it is, is if you look at the stems, and I'll leave this up there because somebody could win this whole box of weeds this evening if you have the right ticket. It has those maroonish purple spots all over the stems. And it stands out like a sore thumb. And as they get larger, those spots get bigger as well. Um, we need the microphone, correct? Are we, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, where does chickweed originate from? Where did it originate from? It was brought here as far as I understand. But I don't know where. We just generally blame the Europeans. How's that? Is, are, can deer eat that? Will it harm deer? It would har harm livestock, but they all know to stay away from it. They don't feed on this. So they'll stay away. Now, where this could harm h livestock is if it happened to be in a field that you were baling hay and you cut it and baled it, it could be a, a serious situation. So farmers will watch for this as best they can. 2,4-D, round up, all this stuff takes care of it. Pulling out of the ground takes care of it. Like I say, it's a biennial. That means it's foliage one year, flowers the next, that seed regrows from that. Um, but I, I guarantee you, now that you've seen this, you'll really see it a lot in about uh, three, four, or five weeks as the weather warms up. Is this the same plant that you talked about on the radio one time that if you're walking through the field, you definitely don't want to even touch it? No. Because it can impair your skin or something? No. Or and right next to this in the same batches, and it's not up yet, so I didn't have a sample to bring you, is wild parsnips. And wild parsnips, 
kind of has the same look kind of but it has more of a celery type foliage and a celery type of uh, stalk doesn't get quite as tall and it's a yellow flower all right but same kind of flat flower and on wild parsnips what we talk about and try to bring it to everybody's attention is that if you went out and weeded the lawn or, or not the lawn but the garden or along a fence row or whatever and you were pulling that out and it's during the sun the sun's out during the day and you get the juice on your hands the rash is like 20 times worse than poison ivy and then it starts to stain your skin it turns it just a real dark almost a black or brown color and will stain your skin for probably a year or two but they say the rash is horrible and if you go online and google it and see people have gotten this rash it's terrible and about three or four years ago five years ago on our show we were talking about it we bring it up every year a gentleman called in and he said you know what's funny he said, well, I was in Boy Scouts when I was a kid, and we were on the Little Miami River. And he said, we were coming down on canoes, and we were stopping and horsing around and doing all kinds of stuff. And he said, we got this patch of stuff that looked like celery, big celery stalks. We were hitting each other with it. And he said, I was pulling it all out. And he said, that night, I broke out in a rash on my hands and my arms that was unbelievable. And he took them to the hospital, and they said, you know, poison ivy? I don't know. We don't know. It's some kind of a rash. You're allergic to something. So it was horrible, and then his skin turned a darker color and stained right in between his fingers. And they, they never did figure out what it was. And he said, as I'm sitting here listening to you talk about that, I can still see that plant, and that's exactly what we were hitting each other with that I was pulling out of the ground and got it on my hands. Photophytodermatitis is what that's called. And so the juice on your hand actually reacts to the sunlight and causes that to happen. Yeah, Google it. It's a nasty-looking, nasty-looking rash. But that's wild parsnips. And actually, the wild parsnips, the root system is edible. So it's not toxic. It's just the, that sap that you get it on your hand can cause the, the rash, cause you to break out. By the way, I was uh, up in Columbus last week giving a, giving a talk to the Lions Club, and there was a gentleman there that was just broken out with a rash big time on both of his arms, some around the side of his face. You know what it was? Poison ivy. Now, poison ivy, if you look around right now, really hasn't leaked out. Uh, he didn't realize that he was pulling vines of poison ivy out of the trees when he was pulling it down. Thought it was like wild grapes or something. Didn't think anything about it, pulling that down. And he thought they had been dead for a while, that they had cut these things off, and they were just pulling them down and bagging them up. Well, you know, poison ivy, when you do that, can last. That, that oil can last in there five, six, seven, eight years. So when you cut a poison ivy vine and let that hang on the tree, you go back four or five years later, it's still there. So you have to be very, very careful with it. When he didn't realize what it was, and he had it everywhere. And, of course, he went and had to take the steroid shots and all. But I happened to have a tube with me that night um, of Zanfell. Anybody ever use Zanfell? Great stuff. It's one of the only products on the market that you can buy, an over-the-counter uh, product that you can get at Walgreens and Walmart. and CVS, I think, has. It's about $40 a tube. Um, but it actually takes the oil off of your skin after you break out into a rash. So you can actually wash with Zanfell and pull the oils out of the rash and have it dry up. And like I say, it's one of the only products that's available for you to buy. A lot of folks will go and look at it and say, 40 bucks? Well, 40 bucks to me is a lot better than sitting there itching and, you know, fighting with all this poison ivy. So I gave that to him, and he emailed me this week and said it actually worked where he had used it in his fingers. So. Z-A-N-F-E-L. As a matter of fact, if you go to their website, it's a great website. And we always have, oh, my gosh, I can't think of his name. It's on our show about once a year when we get into poison ivy season. He knows more about poison ivy. They actually have a poison ivy convention where they, I, I don't know who all goes to it, but they actually go and talk about poison ivy. By the way, he helps every year with me because I, get, I don't get into arguments, but I always have people that argue with me about this. When I say there, are, there is no poison oak in the state of Ohio, there isn't. It doesn't exist in Ohio. And somebody will always step forward, oh, yeah, it does. I've gotten poison oak. I've seen it, seen it growing. It doesn't exist in Ohio. Oh, yes, it does. No, it doesn't. It doesn't exist here. Poison ivy can look like all kinds of things, including poison oak. If you look at poison ivy and in in, grown in the woods, it looks like anything and everything. As a matter of fact, I've got pictures, it always kind of flips people out, you know, the leaves of three, that terminal leaf, 18 inches long. So you walk by this thing and you're like, that's not poison ivy. And it is. It's got this leaf that's this long. 
I've got pictures of poison ivy with leaves that are that big crawling below the turf where you never even see it. So it can really disguise itself in there. Yeah, I, I used to get poison ivy fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. And a chemist friend from um, a large soap company here in town told me, he said, wash with Dawn. I've never gotten it since then. As long as you do it quickly when you come in. And, and that's, that's the key. You're exactly right. And whether it's Dawn or whatever you use, we'll, we'll promote Dawn tonight because Dawn takes care of the oil off the penguins and all whole So that's a good thing. But you're right. And that's, that's the whole point that even the gentleman from Zanfil will tell you. When you're working in the garden and you know you've got poison ivy, you're pretty sure. If you would come in every 45 minutes to an hour, you've actually got a couple hours to do it. And wash. You don't have to have hot or cold water. Just wash. And he said actually use cold water. Um, and use soap, dish soap, whatever it may be you'll pretty well get rid of it just by doing that. And, of course, when you take your clothes off, make sure you turn them inside out, do all that. He said, you know where they get a lot of things where folks say, well, I didn't even work in the, out there, and I still got poison ivy. I said, well, do you have a dog? I said, yep. Does the dog run around the woods? Yep. Well, guess what? Dog, and they'll get on the, dog, the hair of the dog and stays on there for a long time. But you're right. You, you wash beforehand or, you know, while you're doing it, and you'll get it under control. But poison ivy is nasty stuff, and that'll be coming up here a little bit later as well. But I wanted to make sure that you all saw this and recognized it. Um, I don't have a wild parsnips to show you, but look that up as well so you recognize the foliage. And like I say, you'll start to see it. If you drive through Wenton Woods or any of the parks, um, you'll see it all along the right sides of the roads, along the edge of the woods. It's, it's really out there. Well, since no one else has asked a question, I'll ask it. Um... If you do ingest it, uh, it's poisonous. What symptoms should you look for? For the poison ivy? For the, um, par the parsnip. For the, yeah, right. For the wild hemlock? Wild poison hemlock, hemlock? Right, right. Um, that you stop breathing? No, I, I, to, I, I don't know. You have to go on and really look. But it, it'll cause you immediate, from what I understand, immediate stomach issues right away. And then nausea, and then you just, you're, and it truly is really, really toxic. Um, so yeah, that's why I always try to bring it up, Google it, learn more about it, learn about where it grows, but be able to recognize it. So, you know, and that's the stuff that took out Socrates. So it's, 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 that's what that is. So, so do keep that in mind, but anyway, we'll put this all up here and somebody may win this yet this evening. Who knows? Any questions so far? Yes. Just a second. And what's the time too, because I got a lot of plants to talk about and I always run out of time. Uh, when you talked about the uh, the burn on the uh, boxwood, yes. If you put that spray stuff on in the fall, does that stop that from happening? The, the wilt stop. Yeah. It can slow down that bronzing a little bit. And the thing about the wilt stop, and now they're doing some scientific research on wilt stop and wilt proof, and some's coming back saying we don't see really a major difference using that stuff or not using that stuff. So I look at it and say, if you've had success with it, we have in some cases where it's a high wind area, I think it really does help. But we're getting some reports back saying, eh, it may not be as, as effective as we once thought. Boxwood will all vary as far as how much they bronze every year, depending on the variety. Uh, some will bronze worse than others. If they're in high wind areas, they're gonna bronze worse. If they're dry when they go into the winter time, they'll bronze and die back worse. So there's a lot of other factors involved as well. Um, I still recommend the wilt stop and the wilt proof because I know situations where I know it has helped. Um, especially if you have live Christmas trees and live greens, you please spray that on there. That thing stays fresh for you for a long, long time. But yeah, for boxwood, I, I still highly recommend it in high wind areas. Ron, I've heard you say on the radio, something gets on boxwood and you say just take a garden hose and shoot it real hard with a garden hose and yep. that'll get rid of it. some kind of an insect what is that i've heard you say well they they can get mites they can get uh mealy bugs or woolly you know aphids that type of thing those are all things that you can just blow off of there with a garden yeah, hose. as a matter of fact i still t tell folks one of my best defenses with most of the insects that you have out there is a strong stream of water and you get into especially when you get into leaf eating caterpillars a lot of the beetles things like that you blow those off the plant Especially, you know, you get into sawflies in the springtime, which will start showing up here shortly. Um, Eastern tent caterpillars have started to hatch, so you'll see those out there now. You know, you start looking at all these, these uh, leaf-eating critters. You know, if you went out there and sprayed them off with a garden hose, don't worry about anything. Just spray them off and knock them to the ground. Of course, Joe Boggs does the Buggy Joe's two-step, and no insect's resistant to the two-step. You know, they've gotten resistant to a lot of insecticides, but I don't know any that are resistant to that. 
but you can knock them to the ground. And most of the time when you blow a lot of those insects off of the plant, they're like a bunch of guys. They hit the ground. They won't ask for directions. Done deal. <laughs> they have no idea where to go, and they're finished. And you can do a – I was thinking my dad when I think of – you know, all know what eastern tent caterpillars are, right, with the big net, the white nest that you get in there in the springtime. And they will defoliate the leaf, the branches that they were on in the immediate area. But you know what happens when they're all said and done? It typically leaves back out. But my dad, and I still see him doing this, I think he looked forward to it every year, couldn't wait for those to show up because he had this long stick that was about 10 or 12 feet long, and he would put a cloth on the end of that and then wire it onto that, and he would dip it in kerosene or whatever and light that thing up and with a big smile on his face stand there and burn that nest out of the out of the plant. And those things actually make noises when you do that. It's kind of like a zzz or coming out. And he would burn that all now on nest out and all that kind of stuff. And then what do you think happened a month later? It was dead. The branch was dead. And he would say, those darn things, they killed that whole thing. And even though I burned them out of there, they killed that. And even after I graduated from the Ohio State University, I still could not convince my father that he was the one actually doing the damage to the tree uh, and, and not the, the, uh, the caterpillars. But again, just, you know, smash them with your hand, knocking them out with a strong stream of water is your best. At, you know, Japanese beetles. Anybody getting Japanese beetles again? They went away. Now they're back. I don't know where they went. They came back again. Now all of a sudden we got pockets of Japanese beetles everywhere um, starting to show up more and more all the time, unfortunately. But you know the thing about Japanese beetles, it, again, they go back to the strong stream of water. If you went out every morning on plants that they really enjoy and blow them off of there, make them go away, you just chased away the scouts that go out, find the plants that they like, and they put out a scent and say, here's a plant right here. And you also chased away the females who's putting out a scent saying, hey, guys, I'm right here on this plant. Did you like to, you know, date me and chew on the plant at the same time? If you blow them all away and make them go somewhere else, like to your neighbor's yard, it's amazing how you can save a lot of plants just blowing them off. I do that in the morning. I did that in the evening. Done deal. I minimized the damage that was on there just from a strong stream of water. And I was always the nice guy in the neighborhood. I would buy 10 or 12 Japanese beetle traps and give them to all my neighbors. Here, put this in your yard, way over there. And you put that one in way over there because research has found what? Those things draw more and more beetles than that you would have gotten in the first place. So you give them to your neighbors and let them put them in their yard. Um, getting back to the boxwood. Yes. I probably am experiencing some of what you showed, but the other thing I'm experiencing is too much growth. How far can I prune it back and not lose it? Good question. And you want to get on that right away before they start to come out with new growth. Boxwood takes a pretty good pruning back. So if you get one that's kind of overgrown, um, you can go back four, six, eight inches or more. We've got more than that. The thing of it is boxwood could take a couple years before it recovers, so you're going to look at something that's kind of thin for a while. But they're pretty good about that. Boxwood and Japanese yews are probably two of the evergreens that do a pretty decent job with a really hard cutback and coming back. Boxwood being the slowest to respond, but they can. So you might want to look at it and say, I do it over a two-time two period, kind of cut them back, go back a little bit more, and kind of work them back if you do it that way. When I first got out of Ohio State and went to one of the things we used to have to do in Natorps, all the new, new, and I started there in high school, but after graduating, came there, and you had to work on the landscape crews for a summer. And it was a great experience. I mean, everybody worked on the landscape crews. And I worked for a gentleman's name was Martin Drescher. He was an old German. You could barely understand what he said, but he was a terrific designer and a true plantsman. But he would go in, and there would be ewes that were way overgrown, six feet tall. And he would go in there. Now, you, the best time to do it is late winter and early spring, but he would go in there in the springtime, even after it started to grow, and have us cut those things back. And I still remember in, oh, my gosh, it was uh, over in uh, Wyoming, and I can't think of the name of the street. These, these Japanese Jews were this big. And he had us take those back to 12 to 18 inches off the ground. We took them back, and there was nothing but that. Two years later, going back to that job, they were the most perfect Japanese Jews, about that tall, all feathered out, and looked absolutely gorgeous. He believed it, and you could do that. Now, every now and then you lose a few. They don't always come back. So there's always a risk involved when you do that. But he used to do that all the time. Well, then we started doing experiments at Spring Grove Cemetery, like taking, like, oak leaf hydrangea that gets tall, leggy, looks nasty, li lilacs, old-fashioned lilacs, tall and nasty. You know, you go through and you take out some of the branches and try to work them back. Just taking them off at the ground. 
And it's amazing how they responded to that very nicely, lilacs, if they're multi-stemmed especially. But boxwood will take a pretty hard cut back and still do a nice job for you. Cut it back, flush it all out, water it well, feed it with like a holly tone or something like that. And, you know, again, you do take a little bit of a risk, but that's one that I do that and recommend it. Azaleas, rhododendrons, they take a really heavy cut back. Well, I've gone in, folks have had big azaleas and they get lace bug on them, they look horrible and, you know, leg in the whole nine yards. So, you know, as soon as they're finished flowering, just enjoy the flowers, go back in there and cut those back to about 12 to 18 inches off the ground. Nah. So, yeah, just do it. Trust me. Trust me on this one. And if it doesn't come out, I'll, we'll get you another azalea. And they'll cut that back. And sure enough, six or eight weeks later, all of a sudden it starts to leaf back out. Two years later, it's a perfect little plant about that big with new flowers on it. And they respond quite nicely. So there's a lot of plants like that that you can rejuvenate. Problem is most people don't want to spend the time to wait to have them come back again. Holly's the same way. I mean, hollies will respond pretty well to that too. I have really backed off on blue hollies. I don't recommend or plant those like we used to. I think at this stage in the game, if you look at anybody have blue hollies in your landscape, still doing good? No. I just really backed off on those. You know, they, they, they seem like they hang in there for four or five years and all of a sudden start to decline. Don't die. And come to find out there is a root disease that they get. Now we're thinking they may even come with it. Um, that over time as soil compacts, and of course, you all have really good loamy soil, right? Well, as, as the clay soils compact over time, it sets them up for this root disease and the roots start to decline and they just, they don't die, but they just kind of hang in there. And you cut them back hard and try to flush them back up. And I don't think it's worth the hassle. So I've really backed off on blue hollies, but you could at one time when they were vigorously growing would work well by the way boxwood we're seeing that a lot with too in situations where homes have heavily irrigated lawns and landscapes over time that does really compact the soil down constant watering like that all you know the, it will compact it down and boxwood will start to get into a root decline which causes the tops to start to get stem cankers and start to die out piece by piece uh we're even seeing on, on some of the japanese yews that are older now all of a sudden starting to turn yellow and pieces turning yellow. That's all just over time soil compaction. What's the best time to um, prune holly? The best time to prune hollies, if you like to decorate with them at Christmas time, is a great time to prune, and I'm being serious. Or get out there and prune them just before, again, the new growth starts to come out. Now, if you're concerned about the berries, then you can do some pruning, let them flower so you can see where the berries are going to set, and then do a second pruning at that point. But it's late winter, early spring, let them flower, set the berries, come back and do a little bit more so you set. Yeah, so let that happen. And then once they're finished where you can see what's going on, go ahead and do some cutting back because that way you set, you save the berries. But you can do that in, in around the holiday season, you know, if you're interested in using some of those greens for, uh, for decorating. As a matter of fact, I've got some using I plant in our backyard that I never prune except for at Christmas. So I prune them, prune them late in the fall. That would be a good time. Well, if you prune them late in the fall, the, the, the kicker is you also could be removing the flowers. And re if you look at where they flower, they flower on the older wood. You got this, and you got, that's where they flower. If you cut them back too much, you may go back into that and lose some of those flowers. So that's one thing you would sacrifice. As a general rule, think of, think of it this way. If it flowers in the springtime, all right, you, flower, you prune it after it's done flowering because otherwise you're going to remove the flowers. So holly would fall into that category, um, although I like to do a little pruning before the flowering comes out. If it flowers in the summertime, prune it in the spring because it flowers on new growth. Hydrangeas get very confusing. Anybody have had your hydrangeas in your yard? There are so many new hydrangeas coming along today. I think every week I get a notice about two more new colors, especially the macrophylla types. It just drives you nuts. There's so many out there. But pruning hydrangeas, when to prune them so that they flower, gets very, very confusing because it depends on the um, species of hy hydrangeas. And I've got a great tip sheet on that. You can email me and I'll send it to you. It helps you walk, walk you through that. The macrophylla types, which have the pink or blue flowers, you have those in your yard? Um, this year, they looks like they got a pretty good hit from the winter time. And if they got a pretty good hit from the winter, Guess what? That means you lost the flower buds that were set there from last year. And that's usually why they don't flower. Or if you cut them back at the wrong time. 
The thing about the Endless Summer series is they were developed because they flower on old and new growth. But as time has gone along, we have found out that when they really get hit hard and you cut them back hard in the springtime, it takes until September for them to start to flower on the new growth. They do, but it's later in the year, so you have to kind of hang in there with it. And I think folks are a little disappointed because they thought they would come right back up and continue to flower, and they do, but it's late in the season. But that can be very, very confusing for you, all right? All right, I've worked through all of those. A um, couple things before I get into the plants. Every, and I've got a handouts up here for you, so help yourself to this. I've got a handout for Natorps Nursery Outlet with a 25% off coupon. And I've also got a pack of uh, seeds for the bees to help feed the bees. So help yourself to those. But in the back of this packet that I put together, and it's mostly focused on pollinators, there's a list in the back of this packet that says the Yard Boys points to ponder. And these are things that I came up with or I have come up with over the last three, four, or five years that I think are very, very important for us all to think about when we're working in the yard and garden or container gardening or whatever it may be. And they're not in any particular order, although the top two or three I think are probably the most important. But, you know, I try to bring up as many as I can when we get a chance to talk about yardening. And I'm not going to go through all of them tonight because I would keep you for three or four hours or you would eventually leave. But the top of my list of the yard boys points to ponder is this. It's very simple. Number one, plant a tree. So why am I going to every garden talk? And if you listen to the radio show, I end every show by saying and think about where you're going to plant a tree. Why is that important to me? Why is it important to you? Why is it important to anybody? Cleans the air. Gives you shade. Holds the soil, erosion control. Wildlife. Looks good. You love them. Anybody losing any old trees? Anybody lose ash trees thanks to the emerald ash borer? Anybody replacing all of the trees that are ash trees are being replaced or being killed in the woods? You know, we got trees dying off all the time for natural reasons, disease, insect, construction, highways, whatever it may be, or people just getting tired of that tree growing there and they cut it down. It's, it's interesting how today cutting down a huge tree in somebody's yard is no big deal anymore. It used to be, you know, you wouldn't let anybody come near your tree with a chainsaw and today. If you don't like it, you just take it down, plant something else. Um, but planting a tree is, if you could do any one thing to help out the earth, you can argue global warming and climate change and whole nine yards. But if there's one thing you could do to have the most impact on, on Mother Earth, one thing, it would be plant a tree. And that's why I ask all the time, every week, every talk, every handout that I have, I ask people to just think about where you can plant a tree, one, two, three, whatever it may be, one a year, one every other year. I don't care, but plant a tree. And you may say, sit there and say, well, you know what, Ron? I already have too many trees in my yard. I'm raking leaves every fall, and it just drives me crazy, and I don't need any more trees in my yard. And how would I answer the thing about the leaves, by the way? You should mow them back into your turf. You should mulch them, keep them in your own yard. That should be a benefit. You should be praising your trees for the leaves that they drop on the ground for you to use for the future. But the thing of it is, is that if you have too many trees or enough trees in your yard, I understand. But there's a lot of places that don't. Churches and parks and schools your next door neighbor. Now don't go and plant a tree in your neighbor's yard and surprise them when they get home. They get this big oak tree now off their patio. Surprise! Look what I did for you. Ask them first, but plant a tree. So promise me you'll think about that and not just think about it, but plant a tree sometime this year or two or three or whatever it may be. It is super, super important. If you never did anything else when it comes to gardening, plant a tree, please, for Mother Nature. That's why that's at the top of my list. And you know research now is great. All this research is coming out talking about the benefits of trees. You could go on forever talking about the benefits of trees. I mean, as simple as crime rates in neighborhoods go down when there are trees planted and the sidewalks and along the streets and the yards or whatever, crime rate actually drops. Did you see the research done in Cincinnati where they, there was predominantly ash trees in a neighborhood and a lot of loss of trees and big major loss and that the the actual numbers of deaths in the neighborhood from whatever causes actually went up. And it was right here in Cincinnati, kind of one of those things that kind of slid under the radar. 
Um, anybody hear about forest bathing? Japanese have been doing it for 2,000 years. And it's, you know, it's going out and going and getting into the woods and not just taking a hike, but walking out in the woods and sitting down and just absorbing what's around you, looking up into the trees and absorbing what's there. You cleanse your soul. You cleanse your mind. As a matter of fact, guess what doctors are writing prescriptions for today? Get your out of the house and go out and take a walk in the woods. Go to the Crone Conservatory. Visit the Cincinnati Botanical Garden and Zoo. There's more there than Fiona. And enjoy Mother Nature. And they're writing prescriptions now to get you out. My mom used to get out of the house and could blow the stink off of you. I really, I was, we lived on a farm, so I was actually outside all the time. But, um, but you know, that's the deal. And, 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 and research, and I just saw a thing a couple weeks ago saying that teenage suicides and depression could be reduced if we could get these kids outside working more in gardens and spending time in Mother Nature than doing what they're doing right now. So we're seeing all this research. P patients in the hospital, this has been out there for years, recover quicker and use fewer pain medications. If they have a window that looks out into the trees or woods or have flowers in their, in their room or whatever it may be, they recover quicker. So there's so many benefits. I cannot push it enough for you to get out and figure out where you're going to plant a tree somewhere. Sometimes I ask people to raise your right hand and lie to me that you're going to go out and plant a tree. I'm not going to ask you to do that tonight. But think about it, seriously. Number two on my list, and that's what this handout's all about. It says, get pollinated. Not literally. But it's be friendly and pollinator polite in your gardening, whatever you're doing. Why is that number two on my list? Because what's dying? The bees? The pollinators? We're losing them at alarming rates. Actually, it's gotten a little bit better over the last couple of years. It's, it's, we're seeing finally starting to come back around again. But we are losing our pollinators. And when we talk about, and, and of course, the honeybees are getting most of the attention, obviously, because why, why do we focus more on the honeybees than anything else? Well, because they're grown as a crop. It's an agricultural crop, so they can keep records of what's going on with honeybees. Whereas with the native bees and things like that, it's a little bit harder to keep records. So we see what's going on with those, with those uh, European honeybees. Um, but, of course, we've got our native bees that are out here as well. And you're all familiar with our native bees, right? You know there's over 4,000 species of native bees in the United States alone? 4,000 species of native bees, not including the European honeybee. And, by the way, why is it called the European honeybee? Because they brought them here just along with the chickweed and the crabgrass and a few other things. So if we have all of these native bees in the United States of America, North America, why did they bring the honeybees here from Europe? For honey. Because of the honey. Native bees don't produce honey. That's what I was saying. Native bees are strictly reproducing, and that's what makes them such great pollinators. Honeybees are reproducing but they're also going out and collecting and making honey which they like their honey so they brought them along and the, the uh, uh, American Native Indian from what I've read used to call them the white man's flies because they had these hives in their colonies and of course they loved the honey once they got to taste it but think about this you know we're, we're, and, and I say that the European honeybees getting all the attention which is good it's a great thing but who was pollinating all the things we had here before the European honeybees got here our native bees. So we should be doing everything we can for our native bees as well, and rightfully so, and they're now getting a lot more attention, a lot more books out there to learn more about our native bees. Um, a few years ago, anyway, there was uh, a lot of talk about the African bee that had come over here that was, ki that was killing, um, you know, our bee population. I haven't heard about it for a while. Because they've done a great job of taking care of, of them. it. Yep. Okay. Not, it has not been an issue, any, as much of an issue, if any at all, anymore. I'm a beekeeper, okay, and... You uh, know what? I was going to ask if there's any beekeepers, and is that man right there needs a, a round of applause right there, because that is hard work. I'm serious. Well, I, I used to live in Los Angeles County, okay, and I, and I actually collected the first swarm of Africanized bees in, in L.A. County back really? about 1998. 
Uh, but the, um, the, the African bees, the, the ones you hear about are so dangerous, they actually interbreed with the, with the European bee. Okay, and because of their, their reproductive cycle, they can actually take over um, in, in a particular area over with, with, the, with the European bee. But they tend to have stopped about the middle of Texas. Okay, they are into this country and they are into Southern California in Arizona, New Mexico, but they have stopped around the 33rd and 34th parallel. There you go. Seriously, when I say applaud you, because being a beekeeper, you're doing it for the fun of it, right? Yeah. Well, I'll be, and for the honey. Yeah, but it's a lot of work. We've been trying to establish a hive on our nursery for the last three years, and we're losing them, and we're having a hard time. And I understand you got to really work at it and get them together, but it's a lot of hard work. And I think the thing what we're asking people when, I, when we talk about the bee friendly in your garden and be pollinator polite, we're not asking people to be beekeepers. And again, I applaud you for doing that. But we're asking you to be a, be a bed and breakfast in your garden for the bees that are out there, for his bees, the European honeybees, and the native bees that are out there as well. His bees, you know, if you live within five miles of him, could show up in your, in your yard, two miles. If it's a lot of wind, five miles. <laughs> but yeah, two miles easily, they can show up in your yard. So when you're gardening in your yard, you're actually gardening for his bees and anybody else that has bees that are out there. So, you know, again, that's where, and that's where this thing is mostly focused, is learning more about what you can do to be friendly in your gardening, to be pollinator polite in your gardening, and help out the native bees that are out there. As a matter of fact, you see these things being sold a lot now. They're just, you put them out there. Native bees need a place to lay their eggs, and that's exactly what that is. They will go and lay their cocoons in there, and you can, you can actually harvest those and put them in the refrigerator and keep them over the wintertime. Um, a lot of these are being sold with um, cardboard tubes that you take out, put them in a Ziploc bag, put them in the refrigerator. In the springtime, bring them back out. Mason and orchard bees, put them out and let them hatch out You know when the something's in flower. Mark on there that they're not sausage links. Do not eat, not a dog treat, do not feed the dog. Um, but you can actually, it's a, it's a build it and they will come. That, you can actually increase the populations of mason bees uh, or orchard bees in your own backyard just by doing things like that. So again, I encourage you to read through this handout that's here so you learn more about the pollinators. Um, and I'll, I'll, I don't know about how you're doing as far as the mite issue, but you know, with the row of mite, been an issue for you? And you know, when we really started to see colony collapse disorder? So does anybody want to answer this question? Now think about what I just said. A ton of research going on right now for honeybees and good, good thing. The number one reason for honeybee decline in the, in the world, not just here, but in the world, the number one reason, and I'm not talking about the native bees, we're talking about the honeybees. Number one reason for decline? The Varroa mite. Everybody says pesticides, insecticides. That's actually number five on the list. Now, that is an issue, and there is a problem, and we have to address that. But it's the varroa mite, and that's what beekeepers are dealing with, trying to figure out how to get this thing under control. They're infesting the hives. They're like a tick. So they're like a tick on the bee. I mean, that's how, that's how small they are. And when they infest, infest they, they cause them to become less hardy. Um, they can't withstand stress and other things that are going on and it's a major issue so that's the big research going on right now is to help out the beekeepers to come up with cultural practices miticides all these things to try to get this varroa mite under control and you were in california when you first started what's interesting about the this the these mites and the diseases and insects that they can vector or the diseases and uh, viruses that they vector is that out in california and the almond orchards out there how do they pollinate those almonds? They bring in thousands, hundreds and thousands of honeybees from all around the United States. And if by chance your bees have that mite or disease or whatever, guess what they're doing? Sharing it with the bees that are out there as well and bringing them back to Ohio or wherever they may be. For the, uh, for the almonds, uh, the, the almond growers will actually import uh, between a half a million and three quarters of a million 
beehives just for the pollen program. And it only lasts for about three weeks. So they truck them in, truck them out. Truck them in and truck them out. Yep. But that's where this can all be a problem as well. So lots of research going on. I'm not going to get into all that tonight. And again, I applaud you for being a beekeeper um, because it, it's a lot of work. There's a, it's very rewarding. How many times do you get stung every year? I put in new bees just the other day, and, and, um, and I put in three colonies of bees, and I probably got stung maybe twice or three times, but that's all. And you said, mm, that feels good. Well, no, I just, I just, um, I have a lab coat that I wear and a hat, right. but that's all, just bare hands. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm do I've been doing the same thing with the hives we've been working with at, 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 at the nursery, and I've been not using the equipment, and so far I've been lucky, but I hate being stung by bees. I mean, I absolutely hate it, but... Again, it's part of the deal, but you know, you're right. And I, I like using my own hands, but it's amazing how they get to know you and kind of like your little pets, aren't they? Well, no, you just, you just move slowly. Just, you're, you don't you're exactly right. Okay. You don't want to use any, any kind of um, uh, floral soaps. You don't, you don't want to use aftershave, no perfumes. Okay. No hair gels or anything like that because they'll be attracted to that. Right. And no beer, absolutely. Still afterwards. You have to drink the okay. beer after you're done. Beer, with beer is afterwards. Yeah. Okay, no beer. They, they hate the, the flavor of alcohol. And they become very aggressive. There you go. And you have to wear light clothing. They don't like dark clothing. See? So, again, that's why I applaud you for all you do. Thank seriously. You. And so how can you help? Well, there's a lot of ideas in here, but one of the biggest things, do you sell your honey? Is to support the local beekeepers. If you could do anything at all to help support these people that are doing this, is to buy local honey. So when you buy honey from wherever you're buying honey, make sure the label is from somewhere local. All right? Do I? Oh, that's why he's, he's that's why this guy's in such great shape. Eating the pollen, eating the honey, and getting stung three times a day. But seriously, buy, make sure it's from somebody local when you're buying it and support those beekeepers. It's an expensive thing to do. And if by chance swarms do show up, and I saw Channel 9, I think, had a story yesterday on swarms because they're going to start happening here. Folks like him would love to have that swarm of bees. They'll come and suck those right up and take them back, and that's a free uh, free hive or a free uh, queen and whatever. For you know, It could be 150 bucks to get those started or more. Yeah. So if you see a swarm, don't panic. Call him, and he'll come and get them for you. I have a question about a tree. Yes, it's getting uh, the trees. I had, That's why I'm here, right? I had a local arborist a couple of years ago plant a red maple, mm -hmm. red sunset maple, and I have a pretty generous sized mulch ring around it. It's never really gotten that scarlet red. And I, I had the arborist that put the tree in come one year and he put some kind of uh, stuff in the soil, and it helped it a little bit. But how do I get that, the leaves on that tree to get that gorgeous red? I don't know that feeding a tree or doing something like that helps to increase the fall color. It's the individual tree itself. Now, when you buy October glories and red sunsets, they're all cultivars that were chosen for their good fall colors. But one thing I always recommend, folks, is if, you, if, you're, if you're planting in the fall, so elected, did you see it in the fall when you bought it? Is to buy the tree in the fall so you know the amount of red color that that tree's going to produce. And they typically stay with that because it'll vary sometimes. You can look at a row at our nursery of some of the, some of the red maples and they're not all as dark red as some are a little bit lighter than others. And that does happen. Obviously keeping the tree as healthy as possible does help you as far as getting the, uh, the, the, uh, the colors there and being healthy. But the thing is you have to think back to the old science class and biology class of why they turn colors in the fall. You know, the sugar buildup and all of that. So if the tree's not really healthy and you're not getting a lot of that going on, maybe it doesn't give you good color. I still, I, I think of, of a um, home that's off of Fields River Road. We went through this for four or five years. It just, every maple in the yard, neighborhood was brilliant red. And this one just would not, and we did everything. We tried to feed it. We tried to do everything. Could. It grew like a weed. It looked great during the summertime, but just didn't have a fall color. Believe it or not, finally wound up taking it out and replacing it with another one that now gives them good fall color. We just could not get that particular maple to color up. And it was that tree. 
So, you know, I don't think the feeding and all that really, I think it was probably more of a weather related situation, good sunny days, cool nights, all of that, that probably brought a little bit more red into it. But that plant itself is the one that's going to determine and the health of the tree. Um, but I don't know that feeding and all that's going to really Hey, Ron. Work is magic, unfortunately. I just wanted to well, let you know. How much time? You have no, 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 no. You oh. have 20 minutes, but I didn't know if you wanted to keep taking questions yep. or you wanted to cover your plants. By the way, in my handout, I have a chart on trees for our area. I have a chart on there of trees at different heights. I have native trees that are available. The question came up, and one of the reasons why I was brought in here tonight is because um, trying to find a tree and going to individual garden centers or whatever and just not getting an answer that you're looking for. And I think the thing to remember about when you're buying trees is that um, most garden centers around here don't grow their own trees. They buy those in from somewhere, from Natorps or wherever a nursery that's sharing or whoever happens to be growing them or from uh, other states. Um, so they buy in or bring in what they think are the best, which is fine, um, or, or have a more limited selection. And I can boast here a little bit, like at, at Natorps, we grow over 200 different types of trees. So we have a larger selection to show you different types. Of, and it can be very confusing, as a matter of fact. But I think that's somewhat times why you see such a, a more limited, and they're trying to sell you what's theirs because that's what they believe in. And those are the five maples or the five whatevers that they think are the best. And that's why the selection's like that. Um, you know, do your, all I can suggest is do your homework. And then if you find a tree that you think would fit by doing your homework, then you call around and see if who's got it, who's growing it, or can they get it for you? Because a lot of times if they're buying from nurseries that are like on, you know, West Coast, East Coast, whatever, they can actually add that to their orders and have it brought to you. There's a new online shopping, and I'm not one for mail order, but there are a few companies that do a pretty decent job, but there's one called Bauer and Branch. It's brand new. Bauer Branch has several representative garden centers here in Cincinnati. We happen to be one of the growers for Bauer Branch that you can go on and find a whole lot of different trees that they'll actually deliver to your house up to, I think, a 10-gallon container, which is a pretty good-sized tree. So that now is available for you to shop online and actually buy a large selection of trees delivered right to your home or to your local garden center that happens to be a rep for Bauer Branch but I put some information in there for you that you can kind of take a look through too. And I invite you to come out and talk to us sometime and we'll show you everything that's out there that we can help you with as well. All right, quickly, I want to go through a bunch of plants, things I like. Tropical plants, you're looking for something to grow on a trellis, an arbor, whatever. Mandevilla, grows like a weed, flowers like this all summer long. Um, don't try to overwinter. Just let it grow. Let it die over the winter time. Put another one back in the springtime. They've gotten the price down so well that, you know, they're very inexpensive. But this plant will do this for you. The pollinators love it. Hummingbirds will buzz all around it. But it's a great color all season long, but it's called Mandevilla. If you don't like how wild this thing gets, look at the Diplodemias, which stay a lot tighter and a little bit more controlled. Keep that. Will deer eat it? And this really, don't, they don't. They pretty well stay away from this one. A lot of the tropical plants they don't seem to like quite as much. Didn't bloom. They like sunny and warm weather. That is kind of the key. And then if you look at most of the, the hibiscus and mandevilla uh, um, uh, fertilizers, it'd be like a 17010. Not much on the phosphorus, but 17010 or something like that, or even across the board. But doggone it, they love the heat and they love the sun. As a matter of fact, the tropical hibiscus falls in the same category. Bang for the buck, this thing in a container, it just flowers like that all summer long. But if it's not sunny and it's not hot, it won't flower. As a matter of fact, you'll see them like this at your garden centers. You take them home, you plant them in a container next week. They'll probably stop flowering because it's too cold. But then in about three or four weeks, they start to fire back up again, and all of a sudden you see them start to come back around because they want those long, sunny days. Where did it come from? Florida. So that's where they're shipped. That's why they're shipped up from, and that's why they're looking like that. But the Mandevilla vine and the tropical hibiscus, bang for the buck as far as flowering plants, you can't beat them. Um, gardenias, if you, I love gardenias, but they're now the new varieties of gardenias that actually flower all summer long. And this happened, and look at the flowers. They're not like the typical gardenia, but look at all the buds that are on this thing. And it'll do this all spring right into the summer, kind of lighten up in the heat, and come right back for you in the fall again. 
and you can overwinter this one inside. So look at some of these newer ones. And that's Hardy Zone 7. So it'll take some pretty cool temperatures here. So you can leave it out, get it out earlier, take it in, uh, leave it out later in the season as well. Then I started looking at some of the perennials that are out there. Love perennials. This is a cat mint. Anybody use this? There are so many varieties of cat mint today that stay a little titch, that stays really small. It's a walker slow that gets up 24, 30 inches high. This is a, you can see it starting to be almost a, a lavender purple flower. It'll flower heavily. The bees and the pollinators will be all over it. You shear it off, they do it again. You shear it off, they do it again. Great plant, uh, but it's called cat mint. And that one happens to be uh, cat's meow. Perennial of the year this year, love this plant. It's called Allium Millennium. This is an Allium, and you're familiar with Alliums. They get the, the uh, flower balls on the top. This foliage will get about this tall. The tall. It's gorgeous all season long. Midsummer, you get the flowers that are about this tall on top. They're purple. Tons of them on top. The pollinators absolutely love it. But it's our 2018 perennial of the year, and it's called Allium Millennium. It loves the sun. So keep that one out in the sun. If you like lavender, remember she likes to have well-drained soils, um, more of an alkaline soil if you, can, if you can create that. This is phenomenal. Look at the foliage on that thing. Phenomenal is a more bold lavender, um, a lot of flowers, tall. You'll get some height to it. But bold foliage, um, great fragrance, uh, very tough, very durable. Probably one, I think, one of the best ones on the market today, but it's called Phenomenal. So keep that one in mind. Um, coral bells. It's almost like the hydrangeas. There are so many colors of coral bells available today, it's crazy. Look at that. I mean, that's just, that's unbelievable. And when the sun's out, it's, it's like this thing just glows. But there are yellows and there are peach colored and they're variegated in the whole nine yards. It's crazy. Um, I'm seeing lots of folks taking coral bells, taking a whole bed and planting 15 or 20 different varieties in the same bed, a quilting pattern, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, little flowers, obviously, the coral bells, what they're named for. Pollinators love it. Notice the trend here. Um, but keep that one in mind as well as far as perennials go. Uh, annual wise, a couple things I wanted to mention. This is probably one of the hottest plants out there in garden centers today, succulents. Everybody's planting succulents, and rightfully so, because they, they take the sun, they take the heat, they take the drought. You got a planter on your picnic table that you want to put some flowers in there, but it dries out all the time. Succulents are your answer. So we are selling a ton of these, and, and again, like I say, rightfully so, but here's the kicker. All the succulents that are in this pack are not hardy. All right, so in the wintertime, you have to bring them back inside. This succulent, which is Angelina, Sedum Angelina, which is a ground cover, is very hardy. Hens and chicks, very hardy. So when you're buying succulents at your local garden centers, make sure you know which are hardy and which are not. Now, they can all go inside over the wintertime, but only some of them will last outside over the winter. Now, look at this compared to this. Lemon coral, annual sedum. Angelina perennial hardy sedum. This is really cool. It gets like about the size of a basketball, rounds off. It is gorgeous. It'll hang over the side of pots, absolutely. and it's a quick grower too. But my point being is make sure you know whether they're hardy or not. Here's another one that falls into that category. There are a bunch of annual ornamental grasses available for you to plant that grow like weeds, that get big. Cincinnati Botanical Garden Zoo has all their vertigos and all those that are just out, I mean, five, six feet tall. Um, this is just a purple fountain grass. It'll get about yay tall. Does great in the landscape, great in containers. But guess what? Not hardy. So it dies. And everybody wants to, well, I planted those last, last year, and they didn't come back this spring. Not hardy. So we've got all these tremendous selections of plants out there, but it gets very confusing because there are hardy purple grasses, and there are non-hardy grasses. So make sure you check that out as well. Yeah, and again, we'll try to keep all our annual ones in the annual area and the hardy ones in the hardy area, but that doesn't always happen, so you have to really be careful. Annual-wise, things that I like and that are tried and true, good for the pollinators, lantana. So many great colors of lantana. It's phenomenal. Love the sun, love the heat, great performers. 
Uh, and again, the pollinators will love the, the hummingbirds find a way in our, in our outlet, three acres undercover, and they just hop around to all these. They just absolutely love it, love the lantanas. For ground cover, I still think you can't beat this. Marguerite, sweet potato. And yes, you can eat the sweet potatoes in the fall when you dig them up. Thing grows like a weed. Yes. Choked it out. And they, they get pretty goofy looking too when they grow around the curve, around the inside of the pot. I had this one year, the first year that this came out, we planted them in a bed by our patio. And it was so aggressive, I couldn't believe it. And we let it grow across the entire patio. And it filled up this entire 10 by 20 patio. It was the coolest thing. And I cut out little circles like stepping stones. So you walk through it. At that time, uh, I was doing the gardening tips, uh, segments for uh, Local 12. And we were come, they were going to come out, and we were going to do a couple tips. One on this, it was late in the summer. And the other one on what to do with your poinsettia that you kept over the summer to get it to turn colors for the Christmas. The day before we shot the segment, and it was really dry that, that late summer, the groundhogs ate every bit of this back to the ground and the poinsettias off to the top of the pot. I went outside one morning, and they were all gone. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. True story, but great stuff. Do what? Oh, yeah, they'll chew on it, too. So do, uh, so do the tortoise beetles. Angelonia. Kind of a sub for uh, snapdragons, although snapdragons are finally starting to come back a little bit. But angelonia, so many great colors and sizes, loves the sun, loves the heat. Um, flowers like this for you all season long. Keep angelonias in mind. I, I, I absolutely love those. Coleus, my favorite annual of all annuals. Again, so many great coleus. This is the Under the Sea series. This is called Sea Monkey. Um, it's a little bitty dwarf one. I, don't like, I like the looks, but it doesn't do anything. So unless you have a little bitty container, it doesn't do a whole lot for me. But it's pretty cool up front. But I love coleus. But if you have a sunny hot spot that you can't get coleus to grow, use that. Perilla. That happens to be Magilla perilla. And it, it gives you the same look as coleus. Gets about 18 to 24 inches high. Um, this one prop is propagated by cutting, so it won't reseed itself. Um, but absolutely great color in full sun and loves the heat. Talking about pollinators, you can't beat salvia. That's blue salvia, whole bunches of them out there available for you. Keep that one in mind. Don't forget, this is uh, called hot lips. And the pollinators just love that flower, but again, it's a salvia, so keep those in mind. Here's a plant that is a plant and they will come. We we're talking about the pollinators, the one we did not mention. What else are we having issues with? Monarch butterflies. Milkweed. There are annual varieties, there are native varieties. And you'll find all of them being sold at your local garden centers, and it truly is a planted and they will come. You put these in your garden, I guarantee you, you will have monarch butterflies. Do what? Uh, butterfly weed or milkweed. A container or in the ground, either way. Um, about three feet tall. As a matter of fact, it looks like somebody took the initiative to plant a whole bed of them on the other side of this building right here, uh, which is very interesting. Pentas, I like Mexican cute uh, heather. This is, uh, I'm running out of time, Euphorbia diamond frost. You just mix this in with other annuals and it gives you that sprinkle of the white color, loves the sun. So keep that one in mind. Let me work my way across here. Oh, I love caladiums for the shade. This one's called frog in a blender. Do not Google frog in a blender. Because the last thing will come up is a frog in the blender caladium. You will get everything else. And trust me, on YouTube, folks have done frogs in blenders. So don't Google it, but I love it. Um, corkscrew rush, bog plant. This actually is hardy here, and you can grow it as a house plant as well. But it does great in containers. If you have those uh, heads, you know, they look like a little face, great hair. Great hair on the top. So keep that one in mind as well. Uh, last but not least, my favorite category of plants Herbs. Anybody growing herbs? Well, if you aren't, you should be, especially in containers. You know, you take something like this, and it doesn't have to be this deep, by the way, um, because they don't need very much soil. I mean, you can just grow about every herb you could ever imagine. I could put 10 or 12 herbs in there and just be harvesting from those all summer long. As a matter of fact, I used to do a whole bunch of them that were 30-inch diameter bowls. They were absolutely gorgeous. But, you know, and, and the reason I brought this, by the way, somebody gets this tonight. Um, somebody always asks, because I do a lot of container gardening. 
Uh, what size pots do I use for tomatoes? This is my pot. One tomato. That's what I use. But keep that in mind. Uh, by the way, if you want to get kids or grandkids involved with gardening, here's the key right here. Containers. I used to say, give them a pot and let them grow their own. <laughs> now the laws have changed. I backed off on that. And I say, give them a container, let them grow their own fruits and berries and vegetables. As a matter of fact, there's bushel and berry series. Bushel and berry have all these dwarf blueberries and blackberries and thornless raspberries that all stay that tall or shorter, self-fruiting, that are great for containers, great for in the ground, either way, small spaces, but it's called bushel and berry. Uh, they just keep adding new ones every year. They just added one last year, a blueberry called Perpetua. Perpetua flowers right now. Fruit will set up for a while, flower again in August, fruit in the fall. Two times. It's a really cool plant. Uh, but anyway, think about herbs. And I just brought some of my favorites. It's not all these are herbs, but I call them dinner and a show. This is uh, bull's, bull's blood beets. Beets are easy to grow. Foliage is great. But look at the show. So you plant that in with your ornamental flowers or whatever containers. You can harvest the foliage and eat it. You can harvest the beet and eat it. Or just let it grow and do that. Dinner and a show. I love it. Look at this. This is a kale. It's called cosmic kale. It's variegated. Very tasty, but great as an ornamental plant as well. So you can harvest it, cook it, eat it fresh, whatever you want to do, but gives you the show at the same time, cosmic kale. Um, I brought herbs that I think are pretty cool because they are flavor substitutes. This is called a mushroom plant. If you chew a leaf, it doesn't taste like a mushroom, but if you cook with it, it flavors your food like you added mushrooms to them. So if you have mushroom haters in your family and you like the flavor of mushrooms, there's a good way to trick them. Use the mushroom plant. Very, very cool plant. It looks nice as well. Anybody have these growing in your yard right now? You know what I say about onions in your yard? $3.99 at Natorps, free in your own backyard. Because you can eat them. They're very edible. But the best part of the chives that I like is coming on right there. The flowers. They are the tastiest part of growing chives. Take the flowers, crumple them up in a salad, and you will absolutely love it. Um, I grow them for the for the uh, green also, but you can't beat them as far as uh, uh, the flower goes for that flavor. If you like basil, um, minette, or bouquet, my favorite, these little bitty leaves are packed with flavor. Anybody want to be a guinea pig? Oh, you got to eat one. There you go. Whoa, huh? Little quarter inch leaf. Yeah, little quarter inch leaf, and that thing is powerful. And you don't have to cut them up because the leaves are so small. 18 inches high and wide, great in a container. It's called uh, bouquet or minette. And it really does have a powerful flavor to it. So keep that in mind. If you like growing sage, do this one. Beer garden. Uh, you like this one. But only after you've messed with the bees, right? <laughs> it has huge leaves. It doesn't bolt until or flower till later on in the season. It is a perennial. Um, but huge leaves, great producer. The thing about this, if you've never done this before, take these leaves and deep fry them in olive oil, add a little salt, uh, sea salt on the top, and you have uh, sage chips are outstanding. You will be the hit at your next party. Between your bees and a little beer and a beer garden, and the, uh, you, you, you would be a real hit. <laughs> How many people grow mint? How many people wish you didn't grow mint? Mint was meant to be grown in a container. Bottom line, this is Kentucky Colonel. It will be very famous next Saturday. Kentucky Derby Day, mint juleps is what they use, Kentucky Colonel. That's your one. That's the spearmint. If you like the peppermint, Robert Mitchum. And by the, by the way, if you get the chance, to, if you compare the flavors, come up here later and check it out. But see how aggressive that is? That's why I was already starting to reach out there and try to grab onto something. That's why you grow mint in containers. They do an absolute great job. You want to get kids involved with the gardening? Strawberries. Use Everberry. Um, this is the, the uh, white Carolina, which is the white, tastes like pineapples. Really interesting strawberry. Doesn't produce all that much, but kind of interesting. This is the Lees, which is an award winner this year. Um, it's an Everbear. Look at that. You already got one coming on. My grandson, who's seven, be seven this year, has been growing these since he was about eight months old. Loves his strawberries and containers. When he was a, a year old, he couldn't wait for Grandpa to get there to eat his green ones. He said, no, 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 you got to keep, you got to wait on that. Uh, 
Anybody grow salad burnet? Cucumber substitute. It's a perennial. Anybody want to try it? Pick a leaf off, pop it right in your mouth. It won't taste as strong right now, but as the oil starts to build up, if you have problems eating cucumbers and you burp a lot, salad burnet is your cucumber substitute. So put that in your salad. Yeah. See? Yeah, it tastes like cucumber. So keep that in mind. Here's my new favorite of greens this year. Anybody like arugula? Anybody like wasabi? Yeah, this is called arugula wasabi. And it comes to you late in the bite. You can eat the flowers, you can eat the, you can eat the, the green. This gentleman right here has to try it if you like. It's peppery, but then the, the kick comes on at the end. Tastes like Dijon mustard or horseradish. It's great. Throw that is called, it's arugula. It's a new variety called wasabi. Grow it from seed. And when it bolts like that and goes to flour, you can eat the flowers as well. It tastes the same. My new green for this year, so keep that in mind. Um, anybody, you said you haven't planted your tomatoes, right? If you listen to the show, you know, what's my best tasting tomato that I recommend to everybody? Kellogg's Breakfast. I still think it's the best tasting tomato that's out there. But we had a big throwdown last year in the state of Ohio. It was a manna orange versus Kellogg's breakfast. And if you Google either one of them, they'll reference each other as tasting pretty, pretty much the same. But we actually voted. Co Wilmington College has their tomato parada. If you've never gone to that before, you got to go. Put it on your calendar. Second Saturday in August, you can taste 100 different types of tomatoes. They dice them up. You walk through and flavor them all. So if you've ever wanted to chase all these tomatoes, we had a show, a throwdown, one in Columbus, one at Wilmington College, and a man of orange won by two votes. So it was a tie. But a man of orange is officially the best tasting tomato in our categories. Anybody like the hot peppers? Anybody say there's pepper and no pepper out there is too hot for me? I got it for you. The ghost pepper came along many years ago at a million Scoville units. Now, if you're not familiar with Scoville units, that's how you measure the heat of the pepper. Jalapenos are about 2,500 Scoville units. This comes in at a million, okay? Well, then uh, Maruga came along and Trinidad and Butch T, and it kept knocking each other off and more and more and more. And so far, this is still the winner for the last two years is Carolina Reaper at over 2 million Scoville units. It tastes horrible. So don't grow this one. If you're going to grow one for the flavor, grow the ghost pepper. It's still the best flavor of all the hottest peppers. It tastes great for about a sixteenth of a second. Then your head explodes, and then it's all over. But it does have a very good flavor. Ron, think, we're going to have to wrap it up it. pretty soon because you have to pull tickets to give these plants away. I think I worked through everything. Um, I got the handout up here for you. If you ever have gardening questions, my email address is on there. You can email me direct. Um, you can call me. I'll get back to you in six months. <laughs> because spring has sprung. No, I, I'm usually pretty good about getting back. I can't answer all the ones I get on the radio, but I do answer the ones that come to Nate Torps. Now you know the secret. You email me at Nate Torps, and I do answer all of those. Um, but uh, feel free to email me. A lot of folks, you know, will send me pictures of weeds and trees and shrubs and bugs and whatever. Matter of fact, she sent me pictures of these little bitty bugs that are on our windowsill, and we're able to, if I can't figure it out, I go to Buggy Joe Boggs, wow. and he'll... Yeah, and he'll, he'll answer right back, too. So the, between the two of us, we can usually figure out most of the bugs that are out there. But we can identify weeds and trees in the whole nine yards, so feel free to use that service. Um, be more than happy to help you out as much as I can. Um, other than that, oh, DRAM watering equipment. Best watering equipment out there for you. They've got the one touch on and off. It makes it so easy for all of us. The watering wands, they've been doing it for years. Keep that in mind as well. And other than that, I think I covered everything. Oh, hummingbirds are here. They've been here for a week. They were sighted, the first sighting was the 18th, I believe. So they're here. They've already worked through Ohio and that stayed up north. They kind of bypassed that one. Ron, I left them to Canada. But um, any, any Michigan or Ohio State fans here? You know, the Emerald Ash Borer started in Michigan. It did, actually did. Yeah, so we can all say that. But anyway, well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Ron. Before we get started, I'm going to let um, Jude DeWitt come up and pick a plant because Jude always helps us uh, sign people in.
So Jude, you come up and pick your plan. Don't take that one he said that tastes awful though. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I use both. As a matter of fact, I use a spoma, and I use and I use American Grow Pure Spoma. It's all the all the natural bread. You want to pull a ticket, Ryan? Because I right. don't know how many you're giving away. So. How do you want to do this? Because we got more than what we have to be prepared. We do. Yeah. Well, then the people come up and literally say yes. Yeah. And pick, okay. Um, 306, 2306. Okay. Run, run, run. <laughs> 286. 286. All right. Oh. Um, 312. 312. Right there. Okay. 288. <laughs> She's waiting. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Um, 301. 301. Going once, going twice. 281. 304. Two, eight, three. <laughs> Two, nine, five. That was the basil right there. Three, zero, eight. Three, zero, eight. Right there. Two, nine, two. <laughs> three hundred. Oh, good one. Oh, Diane. 307. 303. 299. Nobody's taking the weed yet. <laughs> 282. 302. 287. By the way, anybody know what the soil temperatures are right now? You know, it's really important. I mean, I, I know I've been bombarding people with this over the last eight weeks on the show, but it's really important to watch the soil temps because it's more important to, to plant when the soil temperatures are right than watching the air temperatures. And you can go to greencastonline.com and it'll tell you what the soil temps are right now. We just jumped into the 50 range. So we're in the mid-50s, which means crabgrass starts to germinate at 55 degrees consistently. So if you don't have your pre-emergent herbicides down yet, you better get on it because we're reaching that point. 296. 289. 298. 302. By the way, I forgot to talk about this one. And while she's doing it, I'm going to talk about this one. Anybody know what the Two seven nine. Two eight five. Three zero nine. 
291. I think we're about out Where'd of tickets. Um, 294. Who doesn't have a plant? Andy, come and get a plant. Betty, you want a plant? There's some up here. And get your handouts up here too. I want to thank everybody for coming to Empower You. This is kind of a chaotic ending, but we usually aren't giving plants away. <laughs> so thank Ron Wilson. We really appreciate it. Don't forget, oh. Don't forget our speaker event next Wednesday. Oh, wow. <laughs>